um, you know, in the states and counties now for a long time. Her company, NIC USA, is also one of the sponsors of Gov 2.0 LA. We thank you very much. Um, and and it was pointed out by uh, Adriel Hampton, who was here earlier, uh, th that the Hillary controls some of the key Twitter handles, you know, for the Gov 2.0 space, um, uh, eGov, and of course Hillary and and Gov 20. <laughs> uh, how you manage to get that, I don't even want to know. Uh, early. early, see that early early adopters always helps. Um, so our, our schedule's a little bit off than it, than was printed on the website. So just bear with us. This is a live event and things happen sometimes. Um, and you, uh, Graham, do you want to get your computer or? That's okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, and then uh, w we're uh, going to have two more speakers after this. Um, all of the videos from Gov 2.0 LA are archived. We post them for free uh, on the internet. So probably a few weeks from now would be my guess you'll see some archived videos, full length videos. Um, and also uh, many of the speakers will be pre um, posting their presentations. Uh, and I'm sure you can reach out to them and find out you know, if you want a copy of it. Uh <coughs> and um, you know, I just want to reiterate something that I've, I've said in my written posts and I've said to many of you. Um, you know, just having people show up here is a humbling experience. Having all this interaction on the internet and people um, saying how much they appreciate the speakers and the information that you're sharing with them, um, it really, I think, says a lot. And so I thank everyone. Uh, you know, I say this every year for four years now. I feel silly saying it, but for all the people who come in here, here in the room, it's like, gee, we're this small event, you know. But then you realize that there's tens of thousands of people around the world participating and watching and learning from you and listening from you. Um, and so I, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been involved over the last four years, the sponsors, the speakers, the people who've been um, participating online, people who've been writing blogs, doing videos. You know, we couldn't do it without you. I couldn't do it without you. Um, and certainly I think that it helps make the speakers recognize that their messages are being heard you know, when they see people tweeting about them and they see people responding. So thank you to everyone here in the room and everyone online, you know, who's been watching and helping with this. Because we couldn't do it without you, I couldn't do it without you. And I think that that's kind of part of the message here of Gov 2.0 LA and of Gov 2.0 in general. So you tell me when you're ready, Hillary. You think so? All right, well, then here's, I'm gonna hand you the microphone. Okay. And Hillary Hartley. Hi all, it's nice to be here. Um, I'm going to speed through this at the end of the day. Um, hopefully we'll not use my entire 45 minutes. And if I do, I'll just stop. <laughs> but um, yes, so as Alan mentioned, I work for a company called NIC. It's egov.com. And uh, we recently celebrated our 20th anniversary. So we've been doing this stuff for uh, 20 years is, is, uh, is an average. And we actually were doing a little bit before that. So we've been doing uh, e-government for about 21 years. We started in Kansas. I'm personally in the Bay Area, and uh, the sales team is all spread out. I'm, I'm on the sales and marketing team. Um, we are doing business in uh, 29 states. We run the, uh, the online portals and the online services for 29 states. So if you go to kansas.gov or oklahoma.gov or oregon.gov, that's, that's all us. And um, we have uh, a couple of federal contracts. We do work with the FEC, and we also do work with the DOT, the Department of Transportation, with their um, Federal Motor Carrier Administration. I always mess up the acronym, but we do uh, pre-employment screening for them and uh, actively kind of trying to figure out new ways to do business at the federal level. But um, just kind of interesting and of note, the, the transaction numbers, the securely processed uh, and the, the number of transactions has doubled really just in the last year. Um, so e-government is alive and well, and while sometimes I feel like uh, Gov Gov 2 gets um, sort of misrepresented, you know, somebody says I can pay my parking ticket online, uh, you know, that's great, you know, Gov 2 in action, <laughs> and I sort of, you know, take a step back and be like, yeah, okay, we were doing that 15 years ago, and it's, but it's it's all exciting, and so that's kind of what Alan wanted me to talk about was just kind of what is Gov 2 and how and, and how we think about it and how it is relating to kind of the day to day you know, core of e-government across the country. So just a really quick shout out. Um, we have a, a group on GovLoop going right now because you are all innovators and everybody watching the live stream are government innovators. Um, we've got a, a group kind of 
that we're hoping to grow on GovLoop. So um, NIC plus GovLoop equals awesome. So check it out. So kind of back to, you know, Alan asked me to sort of talk about what is Gov2.0, and I laughed at him because you guys have been hearing about, you know, what is Gov2.0 all day now. But uh, all of these things are Gov2.0, I think, you know, so hackathons, data portals, mobile Gov, social Gov, uh, the app challenges, petitions, um, you know, the government as a platform. That's the, the, you know, that's Tim O'Reilly's big quote that kind of started it all. And uh, API, all the things, that's one of my new favorite quotes from Ben Balter, who was a presidential innovation fellow and is now working for GitHub. So, you know, all of these things really play into what is Gov2.0, I think. Um, so, yes, all of that is Gov2.0. And for me, in terms of kind of when I speak to our clients and our partners and, and trying to get them to think about Gov2.0 for, for their agency, for their constituents. It's really for me, you know, my thesis statement about, you know, what is Gov2.0 and how, you know, e-government sort of plays a part in it. It's really just sort of stepping outside your comfort zone, stepping outside your standard operating procedures to think of new ways to deliver information and services. So that's my thesis statement uh, kind of going through the talk. And, um, you know, I've, sort of came up with these three pillars uh, several years ago when I first started kind of being the evangelist for Web 2.0 back in, you know, 2004, just internally in our organization, talking to people and then sort of, you know, getting brought in to sort of speak about this. And this to me kind of defines, you know, the sort of your social media platform, your Gov 2.0 platform, how to think about Gov 2.0. You know, they're data-driven solutions that encourage participation and enhance customer service. And that third bullet point to me is really the heart of what makes Gov2.0 exciting and important. Um, the focus really is on customer service because first it, hel it helps us reduce support costs. Uh, you know, you talk to call center people and their, their jobs are just repetitive day after day, hour after hour. So Gov2.0 social features kind of help us surface those things online. You know, we're putting knowledge bases online. We're making, we're making those questions that people have public and searchable. Uh, we're essentially letting users help themselves. Uh, second is you know, just the notion that increasing user happiness increases user success. Um, and if we can help people accomplish the mission that they set out with, then we create repeat visitors, we create fans, we create champions, you know, people who get really excited about something s as simple as renewing their driver's license online. And they'll tweet about it, and then their friends will do it too. Um, and then finally, just kind of this concept of marketing. You know, marketing isn't something that a lot of government agencies can afford. Um, that's one of the benefits of working with NIC is uh, our services, you know, when we build a service, it's incumbent upon us to market it to get adoption to go up. But, you know, a lot of agencies can't really do this. So the way I started thinking about it was, uh, you know, back in kind of the early Web 2.0 days, one of my favorite slogans to emerge from that time was customer service is the new marketing. And, you know, just kind of this idea that, when you engage your customers, when you really listen, listen to them, you know, we've heard just this concept of listening over and over today, that that is your best marketing, you know, and, it, and it's fuzzy, but it absolutely leads to an increase in adoption um, through return visits, social sharing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so with that kind of as the baseline of how I think about Gov2.0, uh, this is just a quick outline of what I'm gonna try to rush through. Um, and all sort of based in what we're doing in our states. Uh, in some ways, kind of the, the Web 2.0 era really brought uh, us uh, as web developers, web designers, kind of brought the web back to basics in a lot of ways. Um, we know that users search, if not first thing, they do it very quickly. Um, we know that if your website is not immediately perceived as usable, people bail, they go back to Google. And uh, we also know that it must be accessible. So rock solid search is absolutely essential. Um, and I started kind of referring to this as BYOL. If you have this solid search, users are able to bring their own link. It really allows you to streamline what you're delivering on your home page. You know, we used to just battle, do battle with, with agencies and with the governor's offices and, and you know, uh, people wanting to have their content on the home page. Oh, this blurb really has to be on the home page. And it just, you know, became the NASCAR problem it's been referred to, you know, um, just really crowded home pages. Um, so Utah, uh, two years ago in 2011, they just got rid of everything. <laughs> they got rid of the governor's picture, they got rid of everything. And they did that, not just on a whim, but they did it absolutely based on analytics. 
they took a look and they saw that search was clicked twice as many times as anything else on the home page. And then they just really poured over their analytics to say, okay, what can we get rid of? What can we get rid of? How can we streamline this even further? And when they launched this, a lot of uh, their quote unquote competitors, meaning their colleagues <laughs> in the, the other 28 states thought they were crazy. But it's really, it, it's absolutely been, um, it's been a boon for the website. I, they, you know, they got a lot of attention, obviously, so they have had people using the site, but also it has not hindered in any way the delivery of services or information. Adoption has continued to go up, uh, transactions have continued to go up. So, you know, and I'll click through here so you can kind of see a little bit about what they deliver. So even just something simple like typing in the word driver, uh, it's sort of an auto-populating Ajaxy thing for the developers in the room and on the watching the stream. Um, so this stuff kind of comes up immediately as soon as you start typing driver. Um, they, do, you know, they give you the the top ten, you know, this the scrolls, but the top ten services show up. The next tab is forms. The next tab is sort of the all-encompassing search. They're trying to do smart things like, okay, well, you're probably looking for the closest Department of Public Safety. Uh, we also want you to know that nearly 300 people. Uh, scheduled their driver license renewal online today. So kind of, again, thinking a little bit about marketing, that's cross-marketing. They're letting you know that this service is available, and not only is it available, but a lot of people are using it. So it works well, it's easy to use, it's secure, et cetera, et cetera. Just kind of communi communicating a lot of really big concepts just in the fact that it's there. Um, so again, this was uh, this is Maryland. This was just a very recent redesign. They launched it last month, or uh, yeah, in the end of March, I think, or the beginning of April. Um, but so you can kind of see. So uh, this is one of the latest states that NIC has has redesigned, and you can see those same things. A, a really prominent smart search. Uh, we're trying to predict what users need. So that that concept of predictability is huge. Uh, we want to give people what they want. So you know, it's based on analytics. Uh, Maryland, Utah, you know, people kind of using this, this search functionality as their main content driver. Again, they're just pouring over analytics and they're saying, okay, we know people are looking for X, Y, and Z. And it's also seasonal. So the first day of hunting season, you know, we want to make sure people are getting straight to uh, getting uh, uh, hunting licenses online. Um, I just took this screenshot and it is tax season. So taxes is there. And that's, you know, those are both, um, sorry, <laughs> those are both, uh, um, probably based on analytics, because it's probably what people are searching for, but it's also a little bit of curation. So we know it's tax season, we want that to be there. So several states have kind of adopted this, this concept that really probably emerged from Twitter of the trending topics. And th you know, the, the underlying theme is that we're really surfacing content that we know users are seeking based on uh, analytics and, and seasonally. Um, I don't know if you can see that or not behind the chair, but sort of, you know, we put a lot of energy into designing our sites, but we also know that just because you build it doesn't mean they will come. Um, so even though, it, you know, you say the word widget and it screams 2005, um, these are still really, really popular. Um, Virginia has a whole suite of widgets that get used a lot, everything from, from the state parks widget to their traffic widget. Um, I'm curious to know if, if uh, iGoogle going away has affected that at all, because I think that that was probably the big driver. But, um, but Arkansas has an online services widget that is uh, geo-based. So you can put in your, your zip code, and then it spits out a list of services next to you, and then you can embed that in your website. So just this concept of taking, um, you know, taking a, a web service and allowing anybody to deliver that content for you, you know, at the end of the day, it's all eyeballs. We don't care how people get to the service. We just want them to use it. <coughs> you, you're talking about uh, like the people who are actually conducting the website and wanting to take a, a product quality or in the case of a higher quality experience, people who take it what they're used to and direct to the web? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, great quote from uh, one of the founding sort of team members at the CFPB, the um, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. Um, you know, he said something like, "Government websites 
should not be ugly. They don't need to be ugly. You know, everybody, uh, you know, your, 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 your world now revolves around what you, what you know uh, from uh, like consumer websites. You know, people are visiting Amazon every day. People are visiting Apple every day. They come to your website. And if it, it immediately doesn't look like something they want to use, they're going to go back to Google. And we have absolutely found that out in our focus group research. You know, we did for Maryland in particular, that was our last big project. You know, we did focus groups in three different areas of, of Maryland. And we had one woman, I mean, almost her direct quote when we popped one of uh, a state website, I won't say which one it was, but we popped a state website up on the screen and she said, oh, I think I'd just go back to Google. So, uh, you know, we know that people are, are not going to use your site if it's not sort of what they are expecting and immediately perceived as usable. So then this little thing came along and everything changed. Um, that is the iPhone in case the screens aren't showing it somewhere. But you know, with mobile, content really becomes the platform and delivery is, is paramount, delivery is key. So we went through a phase of kind of the shiny app syndrome. You know, everybody needed to have an iPhone app and a press release. Um, and we've, we've gone away from that. Now I believe that most of the apps we're developing really are um, of great value and people are using them. Um, but we've built uh, more than 130 iPhone, iPad, Android, and Windows mobile apps. And those apps um, have had more than 1.7 million downloads. Yeah, so, you know, people are using them. Um, you can search for unclaimed property. Uh, I think that might be in Indiana. You can get directions to departmental offices. Uh, you can look up your dentist's professional license. You can tag the buck that you just shot, you know, in the field, and then, you know, send the description of it. I was going to interrupt you, yeah. you know, when, when, when you look at this and you think about where we've come yeah. since, just since 2003. Well, not just scrolls, too. Just <laughs> scrolls, none of these would have existed yeah. in 2003. And it would, have been, it would not have been possible right. to do this. Yeah, absolutely. And are these reusable? Like, can you have different, you, you're going to yes. have to just provide them and it becomes a matter of just recyclability and a matter of storage. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, like for instance, the hunting and fishing app uh, from Arkansas, that has been repurposed, I think, in probably half a dozen states. Um, but but Arkansas was the team that initially put it together, and then it kind of it's kind of like our own internal open source lab. You know, it gets better each time it gets built for a new state. Um, and then they're able to kind of Arkansas is able to go and say, oh, that's cool. I want to put that in mine too. Is it like um, supporting different skill sets, or do you like well you have this enhancement? Can everybody you could turn switches on and off, but it would yeah. Be that's a whole other conversation in terms of NIC. <laughs> Mostly because uh, we, we have, uh, so we work in, say, I'll round it up to 30, we work in 30 different states, we have 30 different teams mm -hmm. um, and 30 different customers. So while we are internally reusing code, um, it's not a, a set mm -hmm. delivery, you know, and it's not managed on any enterprise way. Okay. Um, but, um, so mobile apps. As I said, I think we've moved beyond kind of, oh, shiny bling, this is a new toy, to stuff that really kind of has staying power. And when we talk to clients now, um, we talk about that. You know, not just doing an app because you can, but doing something that you know will have staying power. So for instance, um, these are three of our most popular apps, uh, a driver services app, a hunting and fishing app, and a practice exam app. You know, we want apps that will, you know, either remain installed on your phone because of kind of this notion of endless utility, or we want an app where the user base is essentially a renewable resource. So, you know, you're, you're always going to, you know, have to do something with the DMV, even if it's only once every few years, or maybe you get a new car every couple of years because you're leasing, you know, th that'll probably stay on your phone. Uh, the hunting and fishing app absolutely stays on people's phones. The, the, I wish I had a graph of those numbers. It's just pretty incredible. And then the practice exam, you know, you may delete that after you've taken your exam, but there's always another 16-year-old that is ready to take their exam. So just, again, that renewable resource. Um, uh, just a side note that uh, Maryland app was just released at the beginning of the year or the end of last year. And in Q1, uh, it was downloaded uh, 38,000 times. Wow. Yeah. So on that, um, yep. do, you, do you think that we see government sort of moving towards BYOD or mobile as like the United States getting almost skipping over someone with social or? I think mobile and social automatically go hand in hand just because of kind of how people are communicating. I mean, every, all the case studies we've heard today. Um, and what we talk about is like, especially like with this hunting and fishing app, there's a, um, 
there's a, a piece of the app that is basically like a trophy case. And so you take a picture and you tag it and you know you can say I just caught this you know 16 pound trout um, and you and then you post it to your Facebook wall. And so then you know we're kind of using mobile to reinforce the social and we're using social to reinforce the mobile because then people see that we have an app. So I really think that for us you know the mission is to make them go hand in hand. Um, sorry, you said do we want the apps now? Yeah, or are you talking about sort of, right, right, yeah. Oh, or no, it's still it's still web. I think is 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 first, and I'm actually the next slide is kind of transitioning into that because, um, you know, I'll be the first to tell you that before you go down the path of building the app, you know, uh, as we talked about, it's not just kind of shiny new. We want it to be, you know, we want it to have some utility. We want it to have staying power. But you know, first and foremost, make your website mobile mobile friendly, um, and uh, we're doing a, a fairly good job of that right now. Um, at least in our 29 states, um, the percentage in terms of a real functional working mobile version is pretty high. I wouldn't say it's the majority yet, but it's pretty high. Um, the, and you know, the mobile web is here to stay. I think, I think even just um, probably in Q2, Q3, we will, you'll see probably about half the states have a really good functioning, either responsive web design or um, a good mobile site. Um, you know, the mobile web is here to stay. And if it's not in your current, you know, if you're in your department plan or your agency's plan, it, sh it should be. You'll be left behind. Um, and as I mentioned, the hot topic right now is responsive web design. From a, uh, from a techni technical perspective, uh, the thing that allows us to do this are these things called media queries, which are in the, in the CSS of your code. Uh, from a practical standpoint, basically what that means is that it's one it's one HTML code base. And uh, no matter whether you come to it on a screen that's this size or a screen that's this size, it, the content, the images, the text is all going to resize to fit your screen nicely. Um, so as you can see here, you know, with Rhode Island site, there it is on the big screen, there it is on the tablet, there it is on the mobile. And that's all just one, you know, one piece of HTML and CSS. Um, I'm going to turn this up. This is something that our um, team in Hawaii put together just after they launched their new templates with responsive web design. And there's not any text that you're going to miss, so I'm just going to keep talking. But, you know, it just really kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about responsive web design. So as you can see with that, that browser shot, the, the browser screenshot, um, when, a, when a website is responsive, that's how you'll be able to tell. You can actually take your browser and drag it smaller and smaller and smaller, and you'll see the website just morph in front of your eyes. It's, it's very cool. Um, just to show you a couple, uh, so we've, we've seen Rhode Island, we saw a little bit of Hawaii there, but this is, you know, that's, that's Maine's website in my browser, and then that's Maine's website on my phone. That's uh, Maryland's website in my browser. And that's Maryland's website in my phone. Um, so you can really, you know, uh, it, these guys are wizards. They can just do a, real, a lot of really amazing things. Um, and I, I wanted to show this. This is an old screenshot. This is from uh, 2011 and 2012. But that number there is 2,000. That number there is 4,000. So just from 2011 to 12, mobile traffic doubled. And right now, we're seeing uh, mobile traffic growing in some states almost 25% per month. Um, and you know the, the the big you know quote is that mobile internet use is predicted to overtake desktop use, probably sometime within the next year. <coughs> and there's one last last preachy point when it comes to mobile web, um, because I like to be preachy. Ten percent, we'd all agree, is greater than one percent. Um, mobile traffic in uh, probably an average state is averaging ten to fifteen percent, fifteen to twenty percent. Um, we can all agree that's much higher than a 1%, which is where IE6 now is. So from a web development perspective, we can and should start phasing that out and start thinking about delivering to our core constituents. That's my, my one little soapbox item for the day. 
Um, so again, uh, you know, th the key really for me is that it's not just content. You know, a pretty homepage is awesome. Um, getting, you know, delivering content to all screen size, great. But, you know, we really want to be thinking about strategic mobile online service delivery as well. Um, and, you know, first off, if you're going to prioritize, you want to be thinking about what people are actually trying to access on your phone, so you'll, on their phone. So you'll need to, you know, again, dive into your metrics for that. Uh, in 2010, Arkansas became the first state to uh, provide secure payment processing specifically for smartphone users. They had a whole suite of apps that they launched with. Property tax payments was one of them. And in the last two years, uh, Utah and Maine have built uh, basically responsive frameworks that allow them to deliver you know, automatic mobile and tablet versions for any new uh, web application that they build. Uh, quickly, a little bit about QR codes. You know, some people are, got really excited about QR codes. This is a little bit more where I fall uh, when, when we talk about <laughs> QR codes. <laughs> um, but if you can't see the bottom, it's worth seeing. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, they do have some utility. Uh, so I'll, you know, I'll talk about a couple of the cool initiatives that people are doing. So uh, this is a, just a business card that the electrical division in Nebraska is using when, uh, to, give to, uh, um, to give to contractors. And so they're able to kind of hand out these business cards. And so the guys who are on the go keeping the business cards you know, around, I see you've got one there. You know, so it's, it's a really easy way to get people specifically to your mobile services. OK, great. Um, Another cool one that I don't have a screenshot of because it just got launched and I couldn't get in touch with the GM in time, but um, Oklahoma just announced that they are using QR codes uh, for the medical board. So now uh, every licensee is given a QR code and it goes on their badge, it goes on any documentation that is associated with them, which will really enable um, real-time check-in at clinics, at hospitals, or even during emergencies. So like in Boston last week, um, you know, kind of man on the street, uh, Good Samaritan type thing, you know, they'll be able to pull it out, you'll be able to really quickly kind of scan and, you know, get this person's uh, license and information um, as maybe they are accompanying uh, the people during an emergency. <coughs> so that's, you know, another good use of QR codes. And I, I know that they exist, although I think we are often uh, inclined toward the former. <laughs> um, so uh, the next topic is kind of mapping and the concept of geolocation. And to me, this is just a way to uh, add personalization to a website. So, you know, we've, we also went down the path several years ago of the, you know, my Indiana or my Tennessee and okay, we're going to allow you to you know redesign your homepage and move the boxes around, and nobody does that. Um, I think at the end of the day, the metrics will tell you that that nobody really does that, and that personalization uh, should really kind of come from a more bottom-up kind of uh, uh, a bottom-up system in terms of figuring out ways to surface that bottom 10% of your content that r users really do need, but they're never going to find. Um, and GOIP le lets us do that. So um, we're you know, sort of going beyond the map mashup, mapping and uh, sort of plotting things based on a map near me. Uh, you'll see the near you sections on a lot of our websites now. Those are really, to me, this, this, uh, just this type of, of personalization. Um, so here in Maryland, uh, when you click the near you tab, uh, if, you're, if your browser allows it to you know, grab your location, uh, it will immediately tell you, okay, you're in Annapolis, here are the government offices next to near you, you can click over C State Parks. Um, they've got integration with the uh, DMV, in Maryland it's the MVA, and uh, they're, they're putting wait times up. I took this in the late at night or late in the evening, so there, there was no wait time, but um, you can get your wait time just straight on the homepage <coughs> of uh, Maryland.gov. In Arkansas, they've just got kind of a little section on their homepage dedicated to this, this sort of GOIP stuff. Uh, so near Little Rock, they're showing uh, there are 56 job openings near you. Here are some of the government offices near you. Um, there are 21 online services that sort of uh, could be applicable to you specifically where you are located. In Utah, uh, very similar to, the, to Maryland, uh, they just have a bit more data. Um, 
So in Utah, they've got offices, schools, libraries, parks that you can plot near you. Uh, they also have a really robust public meeting system in Utah. So uh, again, it's just, it's just grabbed my location based on my browser, and in Salt Lake City, it's showing me all the public meetings that are happening this week, and also local jobs. Um, next, social media. Most states, I think, are using the big four, if you will. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, and YouTube. Um, and as we've seen today, there are a host of other apps that people and states and agencies are experimenting with. Um, to me, the keys are just, you know, be consistent, be consistent in your voice, be consistent in your messaging, make it incredibly easy to share, and think about platforms and APIs. Think about what these tools can do for you beyond just, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna use it as a communication tool. But you know, Twitter has an amazing API. Think about how you can use that data. Pull it into your site. Pull it in and help you, you know, tell a story with it. Um, and then, as uh, Jeffrey Levy, I think, became sort of the the godfather of this statement, at least uh, on Gov2 on Twitter. Uh, Jeffrey, I don't even know his title. I just know he's at the EPA. He's He's probably the head of social. <laughs> yeah, he's head of social for the EPA. And um, you know, he, he wrote a blog and, and has sort of coined mission before tools. And uh, you know, just always constantly remind yourself to use the tool that serves your mission best. And you know, I remember him saying that email may be that tool. It might not be Twitter, it might not be Facebook. You might have a really lively and engaged email listserv. And if that is what your community needs and thrives on, that's great, um, but mission before tools. And then again, think beyond the obvious use um, and how their platforms and their APIs can help you <coughs> deliver information. Just a few quick examples. We've seen a lot of awesome examples today, but um, this is Texas's web uh, uh, Facebook page. And I just wanna highlight a couple of things that they're doing on Facebook. So this driver services um, widget here, uh, Facebook now allows you to embed web pages into the Facebook Chrome. So all they've done is they've taken their driver services page and put it in the Facebook Chrome. So now you click there, you never have to leave Facebook and you can renew your driver's license. Um, but it's all driven by, it's all texas.gov in the, in the frame. Um, so it's, it's secure. Mm. Mm. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Um, secondly is a get satisfaction widget. Get satisfaction is a customer service tool that uh, Texas is using. I think I have a screenshot of it a little bit later. Um, but uh, they have it embedded in their website. They use the get satisfaction portal as a kind of an FAQ and a help center. And then they've got it embedded. Uh, get satisfaction has a great Facebook app. So they run it through Facebook as well. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's API driven, so it's all the same code, it's all the same you know, questions, it's just that people can see them in, in Facebook as well. So really kind of just thinking about taking advantage of this vast ecosystem of apps and, and, and uh, frames that Facebook lets you embed in your page. Um, the last one is commercials. Uh, Texas has done a, a series of commercials that they've put on YouTube and to uh, get people to use their driver services online. Um, if you're ever curious, go to their Facebook page. Some of them are pretty funny, um, but uh, we're actually doing a whole other presentation about sort of ROI of social media, and that was a big case for them. They've, uh, they've had you know, lots of views on YouTube, and, and it's really kind of driven uh, adoption up of their driver services. Uh, a couple of Twitter examples, kind of an old school uh, Twitter portal, if you will, from, from Oklahoma. I actually don't even know if they do it this way anymore. This is an old screenshot. But you know, just, just the concept of really taking the time to, like uh, Utah has, uh, taking the time to really make that list and let people know, OK, these are all the verified, um, these are all the verified uh, accounts, social media accounts within our state, within our agency, within our department. Um, so that you know, Utah has basically said, you know, we vouch for all of these, and we know that they are uh, l good information. Um, on the federal level, uh, the uh, GSA has released a, a social media API that allows you to do this very thing so that you can go and you can immediately know if, uh, if a certain account is indeed a federal government actual account. Um, so kind of along that same concept. <coughs> But just really, you know, presenting this universal picture, presenting a stream of what's happening right now in Utah with government, education, jobs, tourism, et cetera. 
And I believe all of these are driven off of uh, Twitter lists. So it's very easy to use the API and embed this in your site. Uh, the next one, Flickr. Um, let's see if this is going to work. Ready? Meow. Um, <laughs> that's uh, Rhode Island's Flickr gallery. So uh, again, it's sort of just this bigger picture of, OK, these are all the Rhode Island photos. Uh, this is where they are on a map. Just sort of bringing a little bit of that into the, into the site, kind of bridging that bridging that community a bit, bridging the community of, of photographers, bridging the people of, you know, who are excited about the fact that their, what their photo just showed up on the home page. Um, just kind of, it, it's just another it, piece, you know, source of uh, engagement, really. Um, so Rhode Island is using crowdsource galleries and combining it with geolocation. Um, Nebraska also has a Flickr group that people can post photos to, and they are using it to crowdsource the photos for their homepage. So all of the photos that are in use on their homepage sort of just revolve uh, through the Flickr photo group. And, uh, and they, uh, they, you know, it says all images used with permission. When you roll over the photo, it's, uh <coughs> it gives the, <coughs> excuse me, the attribution. Uh, and you can click out to Flickr to go see the photo. So th they, you know, they worked really closely with the Flickr community that they built to kind of make sure that people knew how their photos were going to be used. And uh, they were just really excited to be able to kind of showcase some of the local talent on the homepage. YouTube. Uh, there's a few examples of this, but Terry Branstad, the governor in Iowa, has been the one that's kind of been the most consistent with it. He started this thing called Ask the Gov a couple years ago. And um, they, again, he's just been really consistent with it. They, um, they use Twitter. They use a hashtag, which is, I think, AskIAGov. They use Twitter to uh, ask for questions. And they use Facebook to ask for questions. So just yesterday, he said, we'll be filming AskIAGov on Monday. You know, leave your questions here. So they're getting questions through Twitter. They're getting questions through Facebook. And then uh, his team sort of cherry picks. Uh, questions and then the governor records a YouTube video and uh, then puts it out weekly and uh, it's just it's been a, a great success for them and I think last but not least uh, data and another Tim O'Reilly quote uh, when he was first talking about web 2.0 uh, he said you know data is the new Intel inside you know, data is really the powerful thing that is going to help all of these things move forward. Um, so just the concept of, of you know, aggregation, making data available for downloads, um, you know, having these resources for developers, uh, the, the federal mandate now that every um, agency has a slash developer page. Uh, we are trying to also implement that in some states. So you can go to utah.gov slash data, utah.gov slash developers. And uh, you know, trying to make APIs and data available <coughs> to the public. Uh, we definitely have a ways to go. I'd say um, most data portals are still fairly haphazard, um, and some of that is just really because no one truly knows what kind of data people want to play with. Uh, there, there needs to be, I think, more more education. There needs to be more outreach in terms of kind of helping. Uh, public officials understand that data is a big deal and that this type of data, you know, people, if people would really use it and benefit from it. Um, so there's limited data available. Uh, we need to be targeting these high value data sets and figuring out how to communicate that, that you know, hopefully we can figure out how to get them online. Um, platforms like Socrata and CCAN, uh, CCAN is open source. Socrata is in use by uh, a lot of cities and counties and states right now. Um, I think that they do kind of ease that pain of, of consolidation, and it's, it's kind of like WordPress for a data portal. You, you install it, and you're ready to go as long as you have the data. <coughs> and then just a little, little bit of geekiness here, microformats. Um, this is something that a couple of our states have implemented, and it helps Google in a way, and it helps sites that are kind of crawling just understand on a machine level our data a little bit better. So you know, embedding microformats into your HTML so that if you have an address in the HTML, you've got all these codes that are saying, this is the street, this is the zip, this is the uh, city and county. Um, you know, those things are able to basically, when you Google DMV, uh, if you ever see an address come up there or a phone number, that's because you know, Google's getting that on the crawl and they're able to kind of understand some of this content in a data type way. Um, <coughs> so 
if you have you know geeks around you that are wanting to look into microformats, definitely kind of write that one down. And then I think it's appropriate to end where we started, which is again just listening and this concept of customer service. Um, I think really one of the most powerful things that we can do for our constituents as government agencies and, and government entities is to just make them feel like you're listening. Um, and uh, you know, a very straightforward way to do that is to say, well, I guess I'll jump ahead a little bit, we are listening. <laughs> you know, that's Rhode Island's page. Um, and so, uh, you know, they have, they have uh, something here that's called a five second test. It's a usability test. Uh, so, you know, anytime someone takes that, they're, all, they're kind of always gathering usability feedback on the fly and they're able to, they're able to tweak their home page. Um, they've been using user voice as an idea forum. And they've got a Tumblr that is kind of, you know, communicating uh, bits and pieces of that along the way. We'll jump back a little bit. So that's Texas.gov's uh, Get Satisfaction page. Again, it's this uh, community-powered customer service. And then just back here, uh, you know, we've got uh, lots of tools, but one job, and that job really is uh, customer service. Figuring out how to how to get information to people when they need it, how they need it. Um, lots of different tools, but uh, that is our goal. And then in my original uh, outline, I said I was gonna end with a challenge if I had time. And it says I have a couple of minutes. Uh, I do wanna keep it short, but um, I love this woman. Her name is June Cohen. Uh, she is, she's probably actually had a, uh, a title change since since I looked this up, but I think she's the executive producer or something like that of TED Media. And um, if you haven't personally seen a TED talk, turn to your right or left, and I bet your neighbor has. Um, but uh, you know, a few that that I have loved: the Bob, Bobby McFerrin leading the audience in song, and uh, the uh, Jill Bolt. I think that was her name. I wrote it. Yeah, Jill Bolt Taylor, uh, she's sort of studying her own stroke as it happened. I mean. Basically, if you've seen a TED Talk, you kind of know the, the power of these things to sort of take their hold on us. Um, but I digress. Uh, in 2006, uh, TED began putting uh, their talks online, which was, fairly, uh, which was a fairly big deal. It's an expensive uh, con uh, conference to attend. It's invite only. Um, so this decision was a big deal, and I think uh, she had a hard time selling it at first, but she called it her strategy of radical openness. And uh, since then, since 2006, TED has evolved from a 1,000 person conference to something obviously much larger. Millions and millions upon millions of people have seen a TED talk and know what they are and know about TED. Um, these stats are old, but uh, they've been viewed uh, more than 400 million times worldwide. I'd guess that that's easily over uh, half a billion times by now. Um, just as a side note, that's more than twice the number of Americans who vote uh, regularly in a presidential election. Um, they are available in 80 languages, uh, thanks to an all-volunteer army of volunteer an all-volunteer army of translators. And over the last couple of years. Uh, I can't remember exactly when they started, but um, more than 1,000, probably greater than that, uh, independently organized TEDx events have been held worldwide in over 100 countries. Um, my point there is that this is a, uh, you know, TEDx is a local community-driven conference. Anybody can apply to present. Uh, it's people in the community that speak up and say, I want to have one. It sort of kind of came out of this notion of bar camps that started happening several years ago. And again, uh, sort of a big deal to, to the concept of releasing control of your brand, the brand of something like TED, uh, releasing the control of their brand, their format, their idea, uh, you know, was, was a, a, big, a big gamble. Um, but they wanted to make TED Talks essentially uh, a, a platform that anyone, anywhere can replicate. And that's what they've done with TEDx. So continuing with the theme of radical openness, they started this website called TED Conversations, which is sort of a Quora-like uh, question and answer site. Uh, it's a social site. They also released the TED API. Um, but really, again, they're just trying to extend the reach, uh, extend the conversation, extend the conference experience across the web. Um, and you know, 
the open access provided by the, by the API is going to allow developers to build tools and applications around all of the content that comes through TED, that comes through TEDx, and all of its associated data, topics, speakers, locations, et cetera. Their tagline is this, ideas worth spreading. And uh, Ms. Cohen has emphasized that you know, their foray onto the web first, then YouTube, then TEDx, TED Conversations, the API, et cetera, it's not really, it's not merely about maximizing the social web, but it's about finding the best ways to continue spreading the ideas. Um, so what does that all have to do with government? Uh, the theme, again, sort of going back to a uh, quote at the very beginning, be a platform. Think about how government can be a platform. And, you know, if government agencies choose a path of radical openness. That was, again, June's, June Cohen's words, the strategy of radical openness. I, I truly believe that the possibilities are endless. And again, that's not PII, that's not publicly identifying inf information. It's, it's just this concept of thinking about how, you know, we have access to so much data, so much content. How can, you know, how can we make that open in a way that equates to access, participa participation, um, and then, at the end of the day, a more connected and collaborative world. So, in conclusion, I challenge you to find your tagline, uh, your ideas worth spreading. You know, this is a quote from <coughs> Obama's, Obama's very first uh, memorandum that he put out. Government should be transparent, participatory, and collaborative. And if you think about everything that Macon, that uh, the White House has done over the last five years, it really comes back to this. That has been their ideas worth spreading. So g get down to the brass tacks of your mission, find your mission, uh, and really ask yourself, what is the kernel that drives anything worth getting done in your agency? And once you find that, the technology is really the easy part. <laughs> the end. <laughs>